start the recording. So welcome everyone to the second in our test 2020 preview events, this time a panel discussion on humanizing learning with social annotation. Although we meet in a virtual platform, I would like to begin by acknowledging the indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. And personally, the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabek, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, where I joined today. As a settler, I am grateful to live and work on this land. Please join me in acknowledging our shared responsibility to improve understandings of local indigenous peoples and cultures. I'm going to go ahead and share a link to an interactive native lands map where you can identify the lands that you are currently on. I would encourage you to do so now and to consider sharing back with the group in this chat afterwards. Now I'm thrilled to have five panelists with us today. So please join me in welcoming Marie Rutherford, Office Administration Faculty at Georgian College, Julia Forsyth, Associate Director of the Center for Pedagogical Innovation at Brock University, Joshua Barath, Program Coordinator of the Community and Justice Services Program at Georgian College, Maureen Glynn, Senior E-Learning Designer at Trent University, and Ian Robertson, faculty in the Massage Therapy Program at Georgian College. These panelists are really excited to be speaking on their experiences using or supporting faculty in using social annotation in the classroom. But we have a question for you as we get started. And that question is, how familiar would you say that you are with social annotation as a practice? I'm gonna ask that you go ahead and complete the poll. And as you do, you might find it helpful to note that social annotation is sometimes also referred to as web annotation or collaborative annotation. So you might have heard it with different terminology. Thank you for completing the poll. So if I share the results, you can see that we've got a bit of a, a diverse mix here, ranging from really familiar to totally new to me, which is great. <laughs> so to get us all on the same page, social annotation is a practice enabled by digital tools, which takes the usual solitary act of reading and allows readers to highlight, comment, on or otherwise annotate, annotate a text in conversation with peers. Now, highlighting a document or leaving comments in its margins isn't a new practice. But imagine being able to do that with others, where you can see what they're saying about a reading and actually respond to those comments. That's what you see happening in this image, and that's social annotation. Now our panelists have shared with me that adding social annotation to class readings allows students to add new thinking around a reading and to have a conversation about it in context, as in about specific phrases or sentences in a reading while they're reading it, like you can see on this slide. So that then makes reading active, visible, and social. And there are a number of social annotation tools out there how many of you have ever been editing a Word or Google Doc with someone else and then leaving and responding to comments in the margins? If you have, just give us a yes in the chat because you have participated in a form of social annotation. Throughout this panel though, you'll likely hear reference to a specific tool called Hypothesis because each of our panelists are piloting Hypothesis in courses at their schools this term. Hypothesis is an open source tool that adds an annotation layer to the web, as we saw in the image on the earlier slide. And by adding the hypothesis extension to your browser and creating a free account at the link shared on this slide, you'll be able to see conversations happening in margins all over the web and to contribute to the dialogue. You'll also be able to create private annotation groups for your courses and to perhaps invite students to make their own hypothesis accounts so that they can have conversations in the margins of their course readings in a way that's visible to only their classmates. 
This is a free and open way to get started with social annotation in the classroom. And a few of our panelists have done exactly that in the past. However, this fall, the panelists are also trying out the hypothesis LMS integration. The LMS version does come at a cost, but means that students don't have to make an account with Hypothesis and that grades are passed back between Hypothesis activities and the LMS gradebook. So you might hear reference to this because some panelists are doing on, on their own and others are part of an eCampus Ontario pilot that's supporting seven schools in trialing the Hypothesis LMS app in the classroom this year. But regardless of the tool, our panelists have found that social annotation as a practice has helped to facilitate opportunities that humanize learning, especially in a semester that is largely remote. So that's the theme where I want to get this panel started. And so I'm going to start with a broad question to all of the panelists, which is, how, what does humanizing learning mean to you? And Marie, I'm going to toss it over to you to start. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. I'm glad to be here today. I wanted to share with you my experience and my thoughts around humanizing the learning. To me, it supports the key elements of the learning experience we don't often hear about. As educators, we can influence our students' motivation, engagement, and sense of community. In turn, it deepens and strengthens the connections to learning. It brings the course content to life, offering an environment rich in the human touch. It provides a lot of rewards, at least that's my experience. And when learners feel that they're recognized and they're surrounded by support, empathy, and respect from a human aspect, it typically enhances the outcomes. In the early part of my teaching practice, I spent considerable amounts of time planning my lessons and suffering over the content. My focus was often singular in its approach and narrow in its scope. I soon realized the greatest opportunity to engage my students was to be human and to be real and to show my imperfections, whatever they may be. I began sharing my experiences, both career and in my current role as a faculty, and my students began to open up. They began to see an equitable partnership forming within the classroom. Many of these connections that I had with my learners have continued long after I have left um, our lessons at the door, shall we say. So when I hear from students months and years later about how that human aspect had the most impact, apart from the content, it's always something I'm so glad to hear about. From a concluding perspective about humanizing um, the learning from my perspective, I would be remiss in painting that it's a glorified picture, that everything, is wor everything works perfect. It's an imperfected art. It's an imperfected practice. But I think taking the time to consider that human aspect really allows us to reflect and think and also have our learners view us as humans, as we can conceive of, excuse me, <clears throat> the larger community that we are all learning in an educational setting. That's my take on humanizing the learning. Thank you, Marie. That's wonderful. Maureen, I'm going to turn it over to you. Sure, thanks. Um, so humanizing learning to me it is about inclusion. Um, so that means keeping in mind every individual who might be involved in a learning experience and designing the experience in a way that considers um, and respects the interests and the safety and the dignity of all those people. Um, at first glance, when you think every individual, you know, in a course that would seem to include, you know, basically an instructor and their students. Um, but if you, if you take that phrase, their students, when you unpack it a little bit, uh, it opens up to include quite a vast array of contexts and backgrounds and life experiences and learning journeys. Um, as an instructional designer, much of my time is spent in conversation with faculty, usually um, in the context of planning and design for fully online courses. Um, and in some cases, these conversations might represent the first time an instructor has really had time to talk through 
a complete vision of you know what they're doing in a course and why they're doing it. So I try to make the most of that opportunity um, to present for their consideration a wide range of possible perspectives on the goals or the intentions, the resources and the tools, um, the deliverables and the assessments that they have in mind for their course. Um, and when I talk about course design plans with instructors, um, we talk about you know, how their choices might serve or possibly hinder their learners. Um, and I encourage them to think about the possible impacts of their course design. Um, and those impacts could be you know, academic, technological, financial, um, and, or who knows, other personal, maybe even physical impacts. So, um, you know, I, I really just try to bring as many of those human considerations to the conversation as I can. Um, I also try to invite instructors to consider where and how different voices might be presented in their course as a way of making it more inclusive or human. Um, and in the end, in my experience, um, when I collaborate with instructors on their courses in this way, it keeps the welfare and the progress of the learner and the instructor front and center um, with the application of technology um, sort of coming in behind to serve that um, and serve as a support for that progress rather than an obstacle to it. Thank you, Maureen. And uh, Terry Green just shared in the chat a link to some of your, uh, to some other work that you've done on humanizing learning. So thank you, Terry. Joshua, I'm going to turn it to you. Thanks, Emily. And uh, thanks to not only Emily, but the uh, panelists that I get to be a part of today and everyone who's joining. Uh, it's great to see everybody out and participating in this. Uh, when I think of the ideas of humanizing learning, um, I, <clears throat> I look at it from an essential element of student learning because what it does is it creates an environment that allows the students to connect with one another and it supports one another. Um, regardless of the topic that's being discussed, uh, there's always a common piece that's there in terms of the need to share information and to accurately present a picture and explore what the issue is that's being discussed. Uh, when I've talked to my students in class, we, we often talk about individuals' roles and expectations. And one of the things that they say is, you know, as faculty, it's our role to paint these pictures, to share the knowledge, to, to provide them with information and help bring things to life that's being explored. Um, and the learning process that we're trying to work through with students is something that can be rich with very complicated stories. Uh, there's a number of unique situations that we talk about in, in courses and, and we, by humanizing learning, respect the fact that each individual brings their own take or their own perspective when we're working on this collaborative process that exists. By humanizing learning, it gives us the ability to, as I said, visualize or represent the past, the present, and the future ideas that we're trying to get across within the classroom. And it's important to link this information in meaningful ways so that each individual has an ability to fully comprehend what it's talking about in terms of their perspectives. Um, as Maureen had talked about in terms of the technology that is available to us today, unfortunately, there's so many teaching tools and technological aids that we as educators can use and they continually to be advanced. Um, we can fall into the trap that if we use too many of these tools or the bells and whistles to deliver our content, the content itself is lost. Uh, the messages are lost. And what happens is while we have a, a well-intended purpose to use these tools, it becomes misaligned or the messages are actually lost within the tools and the technologies themselves. Um, and, and ultimately, we become too disconnected from the students and the needs that they have in terms of our learning process. So by humanizing the learning, what it does is it really makes it possible for us to use these technological aids uh, to our advantage and en enhance the learning process so that students can become aware of their thinking process and the judgments that they're being um, placed on in terms of the work that we're exploring and also really get a deeper connection to what it is that other students are thinking about at the same time. Um, it gives us an ability to connect, as I said, the content to themselves and the world around them. 
Um, so to me, uh, the process of humanizing learning is, is a great way to identify the individual learners and needs and fulfill it by tailoring the course content and meeting the connectivity between the content and their learning environment. Thank you, Joshua. And I'm glad that you touched on technology because we'll be getting into that shortly. Julia, did you have um, something you'd like to add here? Well, I think um, my colleagues have really covered it really well, but I did want to um, just talk a little bit about and touch about that piece about letting the pedagogy lead the technology and not the other way around because there's a temptation as uh, as we just heard about using all the bells and whistles and um, and recognizing that um, I think Sean Michael Morris says it about teaching through the screen. So there's an actual human at the other end and, and thinking about that when you're teaching. Um, and especially now, I think this is more important than ever, given the, you know, the context of the world that we think about there's full lives uh, that people are living in them. Um, even now, like it's nice to see the faces of, of these panelists, um, but we tend to feel like a head in a jar, right? And there's a whole body and there's a whole life that, that goes with um, all these people behind it. And so it's, it's really one of the leading principles and we'll talk a little bit more about that um, as far as you know learning design that we consider the the whole person um, it, when we're um, creating these learning experiences so I feel like that's like core to what we're trying to do thank you Julia and Ian I want to give you a chance to speak on this um, if you have something you'd like to add to about humanizing learning thank you Emily um, certainly uh, I, I think there's some key elements with humanizing learning that I think are important um, giving learners the time and space to actually be able to, co to connect with the content. Uh, sometimes there's an immediacy to that. Sometimes um, they're able to kind of sit back and reflect on, on uh, their learning. And I think that's, that's really kind of important too, especially uh, as, as uh, Julie noted in this particular time that we're living in, uh, there's an awful lot of pressures on people to, to um, really kind of continue on with normalcy and, and it can be uh, quite a challenge. Um, with respect to humanizing, I like the idea of learners being able to, to draw from their personal experiences and uh, have that kind of inform the overall group learning. And I can think about a particular instance this week where um, the rich experiences from our students really kind of uh, allowed us to kind of uh, look at some material in a, a deeper way. And um, the, the, the third thing I would think about is kind of, uh, again, more of an emphasis on connections rather than content. And I was I was struck by what Joshua said in, in terms of uh, sometimes the, the bells and whistles kind of get in, in the way. And uh, from my experience, what I found is uh, students, if the technology is kind of in the background, but the pedagogy is, is really what's driving stuff and the connections, I think that's where uh, they, they really kind of uh, see the learning and less of the tool that's, that's being used. Thank you. And thank you to all for your answers. So we have a good sense now of what humanizing learning means to you. Um, and so we're going to really move into a question that is kind of at the heart of this panel, which is how are you or instructors that you work with or supporting um, actually using it, social annotation to humanize learning and create community in your classrooms? And Julia, I'll start with you. Yeah, so when when we did the pivot in March, um, immediately we started offering um, sessions on rethinking assessment because a lot of classrooms were uh, a lot of courses were using the final exam, the written exam with a 1000 people in the gym, you know, with a paper exam, and it was sort of like, what are we going to do instead. And so I offered in June a series of like, think about alternative assessments and um, and a hypothesis came up as one. So we're running as part of this pilot. I'm very grateful that we can be part of this pilot. There's a, a large class of 500 doing a Greek mythology course that normally would have had a midterm and a final that was written in an exam and they've actually shifted it. So now they're putting a greater emphasis on using social annotation. Um, and so instead of has, asking questions, um, like it really allows them to get right into the content of the, of the text that we're seeing has been um, really amazing. And so I was going to quickly share, I'll just share the, the framework just uh, as a quick grab so I can explain it better. Um, I did a doodle for you. Is that um, so instead for every reading, they now have um, every student has to ask a question. They have to do a point of interest. They have to make a connection. 
um, and they have to share a piece of knowledge and then they have to reply to somebody else's. And I think the big part about this is about the prior learning. You're recognizing that students come to the classroom with knowing something else. They're not coming as a completely blank slate. And so what we know about learning design is that if you, if you recognize that and you create these opportunities to make these connections, this is recognizing that you have real humans <laughs> and it's not just like, I filled you and now you're going to regurgitate it back as a, as a right or wrong answer, but you're actually make creating these opportunities to really develop critical thinking skills and thinking about the material and it's really been very successful and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, that when we um, carry on but I found um, that's been a great framework um, and uh, the instructors are really happy to for other people to adopt it um, uh, if I'll share the link out to the the Flickr <laughs> um, drawing. Thank you, Julia. And folks, as the panelists are speaking to this question, please feel free to add any questions in the chat. Um, Maureen, you're also supporting faculty in using uh, social annotation practices. So did you want to speak a bit about what that experience has been like? Sure. Um, so we had the opportunity to be, do almost a bit of a pre-pilot in the, in the spring with one instructor. And now we're um, doing a more extensive pilot at Trent um, using hypothesis uh, for social annotation. Uh, so right now we have in, uh, sort of six instructors using a hypothesis across about a dozen courses. Um, in the um, subjects include English, anthropology, psychology, cultural studies, and history. Um, what we're seeing is um, instructors are using it as kind of a lower bandwidth um, asynchronous option um, in place of what might in the past have been face to face seminars or, um, you know, at this point, maybe as an alternative to things like video meetings or discussions. So right off the bat, um, that is um, a, a, a help to students from an accessibility perspective and it's humanizing and inclusive in the sense that it, it provides them with um, options uh, in terms of how they're sharing. Um, almost all of the courses in our pilot, um, they include an invitation right off the bat to um, annotate the course syllabus. So again, that's a, that feels like kind of a, a human way to invite the student voice into what for most courses is um, it's a foundational document to guide them through their learning, but sometimes it can be a maybe a slightly static piece. Um, there's a prof at the University of Colorado, Remy Kalir. He's done great work in digital pedagogy generally, um, but specifically in the area of social annotation. He's really promoted this idea of annotating your syllabus, um, at which he calls um, a low stakes, but high impact practice. And I think we're seeing that play out um, with our pilot at Trent. Um, aside from things like syllabus annotation, um, we're seeing a range of applications. We have a, a large first year writing course and what they're doing is in smaller groups, um, they're analyzing articles. The articles themselves, there are some great voices in there in terms of the writers that have been chosen, but for the students, their annotation um, exercise really helps them to um, use annotation to pull out uh, a writer's argument uh, their reasoning and their rhetorical techniques. And then that helps the students in turn to prepare to apply those tools and techniques in their own writing practice. Um, we also have an upper year anthropology course. Um, and in the case of that course, it's really just an opportunity for sort of collective interpretation of the assigned readings. Um, the students are invited to use hypothesis to highlight parts of the readings that they think are interesting or important and then provide comments or questions related to their selections. Um, when I mentioned the kind of pre pre pilot we it was an English course. Um, we had a, an instructor um, who used it in his third year English course. He essentially um, in uh, across a couple of weeks of his course, actually, he provided the students with um, a selection of short stories. Um, they were um, invited to choose one short story and then in that story to choose one or two words, sentences or passages for basically a bit of a deeper dive. And what he did was he provided a range of 
possible options for the annotation. So it could just be like text-based paraphrasing or elaboration on that selection, but they could also, thanks to the tools in Hypothesis, um, they could, you know, dive into that selection uh, through illustration, maybe using images or memes, uh, or even he suggested geotagging in cases where things like locations were referenced. Um, and he actually took that whole exercise one step further. Once they had, had made a couple of annotations in their selected short story, they were then um, encouraged to go to another one of the short stories and basically uh, take a look at their, their classmates' annotations in that story and, and um, write up a, a very short um, analysis of that short story based on the markup that they saw that their classmates had made in, in, in that short story. So there, there's quite a variety of what we're seeing happening. Um, we're, we're actually kind of uh, excited to see as we're heading into sort of the midpoint of the fall semester now, um, more um, coming out of these the pilot courses and, and hearing more soon about what's happening. Thank you, Maureen. And I like you sharing that the the variety that you're seeing and using this practice across the disciplines. Um, Marie, Ian, and Joshua are each faculty in different dis four different disciplines. So I'm going to give them the chance to kind of speak to their firsthand experience uh, with social annotation and what their what their activities look like. Joshua, we can start with you. Okay, thanks. So. Um, I am a part of the hypothesis uh, pilot at Georgian College, uh, and I'm actually uh, the, the coordinator for the Community and Justice Services Program, which is our Community Justice Correctional Services. I'm using it within the uh, career resource development class that I teach, which is, it's a dual purpose course where not only is it preparing them for future career opportunities and possibilities, but it also prepares them for uh, field placement and community partnerships that they participate in their last semester of the, the program, which will be next term in the winter term. And um, as an opportunity to really, you know, draw those individual unique connections in the humanizing process, uh, I'm trying to use the tool and it's been great so far in terms of uh, drawing connections to things like professional standards, practices, principles, ethics, codes of conducts, and even so much as, you know, one of the core assignments that they have is to develop a professional portfolio, including cover letters, resumes, tracking their, their skills and doing contracts in terms of what it is that they want to work on in relation to their placements and then preparing to work in the field itself. So as a tool, uh, social annotation has been great because it's given me the opportunity to make those connections for the students based on things like job postings. So last week, we actually went through a couple of current postings that are up and, and I'd ask them, you know, if you're in a situation where you're in a, a job interview sitting across from one, three, five panels uh, who may be asking you, you know, very poignant interview questions. And I said, can you give me a situation where you presented conflict management and conflict resolution skills? Would you be able to do it? Um, it's very difficult to do that for the students when they're put on the spot and because they have to think about things, but by pulling up the job description, by pulling up the keywords and the phrases that are used within the job description and being able to annotate that and have the students work through it, they were able to share examples and a great story is, you know, I'm not sure if this fits. However, here's an example. Uh, and that example, not only does it fit, but looping it back to the core competencies within the course that when you th list things like professionalism and leadership and communication skills, and you look at the ideas of integrity and honesty, those are broad terms to get the students to understand and, and draw the connectivity to them as an individual. It's been really useful. And we were able to actually hit beyond conflict management and conflict resolution and hit on, you know, rather than two, eight of those core competencies that they're going to be scored on next semester as part of their field placement agency connections next to the ideas of their, their resume building and their, their cover letter building. So um, I'm using it in a slightly different perspective in so much that it's connected to professionalism, ethics, standards, core competencies, and the development and the linkages between their personal work experience, volunteer experience, and the job postings that are there and their field placement postings. Um, 
but that's the way that I've looked at it. And it's been, you know, very successful to date so far, which I'll share more about after. So. Thanks, Joshua. I really like that practical example. Um, Ian, I'll let you speak to what you've been doing. Uh, thanks, Emily. Yeah, so I've been using uh, social annotation in a similar fashion to Joshua and uh, in another way as well. So um, one of the things I've been doing with our first year students is uh, in one of their professionalism courses, really kind of set the stage for them to uh, start to think into the profession. And one of the first things we look at are uh, the legal requirements, the ethical requirements of what we do. So, you know, I've been able to kind of set up a framework for, for looking at that stuff and social annotation has allowed me to actually allow them to go on and, um, and look at scenarios that I've created around things like standards of practice and, you know, when, when the standards are kind of uh, addressed and that's great, but also when, you know, when those standards are actually not met and kind of like, you know, when massage therapists go bad kind of thing. So they really like that kind of experience because it's uh, authentic. And as a follow-up to that, um, we're going to be using it also to look at some very specific discipline cases that have happened so that they can kind of look at the, the, the framework around things like professional uh, misconduct, how that's addressed at the regulatory level, and really to kind of get them to kind of um, internalize some of the, the, the effective stuff that is often very, very difficult for, for, for students to come to grips with, especially at the start of a new program. The other way I'm using social annotation is with uh, some of the more senior students and it's around orthopedic assessment. So um, I'm, I'm lucky in that I've actually got a couple of courses which are face-to-face -face right now. And what I, I, I do is I prepare the readings beforehand, have them look at them, and um, it really gives me an opportunity for them to kind of look at that information beforehand, identify some sticky points, uh, as there often is with uh, any time you have um, you know, science and people come together, there's always going to be a little bit of murkiness. So they're able to identify some sticky points or things they want some clarity on. Sometimes I can clarify that within the uh, social uh, annotation platform, but I also, I'm able to bring it into the lab and, and really, you know, if there's been more than one uh, person that's actually kind of had an issue with something, I can bring that up. And the thing I've actually really enjoyed is uh, because people are actually uh, bringing their personal experiences into uh, that particular class in terms of, you know, maybe previous injuries they've had or uh, people they've um, uh, seen in clinic while maintaining anonymity, of course, uh, it really has extended that learning. And um, I've actually been able to kind of talk about annotations that people have made without kind of addressing them in class. And you can see there, there's that connection. People enjoy the fact that they've been recognized for their contributions. So um, somewhat, uh, again, the authentic kind of nature of what's happening, again, that humanizing element in terms of being able to kind of uh, get people to kind of make those connections between each other, between the learning. Um, and again, with the, the technology kind of hiding in the background as much as possible. So the pilots really kind of allowed us to do that, uh, which is great because um, it launches within our learning management system. Um, and it, it's, it's uh, an invisible process to the students, which I really appreciate. And uh, I think they do as well. Thank you, Ian. I like that you've touched on kind of those, those themes of engagement and community. Marie, um, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, just to touch upon and to give some context of my experience with Hypothesis, I've used it this is the first time I'm using it as the, through the pilot, through the LMS, and I have used it um, external to the LMS in prior years. And the way I'm using it most effectively, I think right now, is by I'm, I'm actually engaging it with my senior students and asking them to apply their prior knowledge in a lot of what we're reviewing. My students are going into the health care team environment and they're going to be a contributor within that environment so every week we are presented with a variety of different articles that relate to current findings current um, research that's occurring right now these kinds of, of pieces so there's often a web-based article that we review as a group in a collaborative manner where we individually read the article and then we post what we think about the article kind of in an opinion piece, but again, I'm asking them to apply their knowledge in the context of how is this, you know, 
how do you come to this conclusion? So they have the opportunity to evaluate it from a critical deeper dive perspective and they can provide their positions. And what I find really interesting is they're posting that initial con comment based on a parameter of asks. Um, and what I find interesting is they keep dipping in as as a week of that posting is available to keep seeing what everybody else is posting. So it's kind of cool to see how maybe some insights and original positions have changed. Some of the sessions form a, an, a basis for my evaluation, but not all of them. I, I want to spur the conversation. I want the deployment to be um, not so based on, on evaluation, but it does offer that kind of availability with it deploying through the MLS, we can grade through it and offer that, which is great because when I used it in the wild, like wild, I couldn't do it. I would have to pull everybody's individual postings. And one of the things that I'm finding really interesting is for a project based, I have my students, again, my senior students pulling in an OER that's available in the open library and we're evaluating it for its content in terms of how does it support the learner. So they're looking at a resource through the lens of a learner as the end user and they're providing insights and feedback on this particular OER and they're also going into individual groups to evaluate, you know, six people may be looking at this chapter, another six, but everybody can see the feedback that's going in. Students are loving that aspect of it, that they're able to critique activities, content, and, you know, the feedback that they are giving can be moved forward if they wish to do so. So I'm kind of excited. I'm finding what we're able to do really interesting and it's engaging. Thank you, Marie. Um, Thank you. Did you want to drop that the link to that um, open educational resource in the chat, maybe for the attendees to see? I could do that. <laughs> awesome. Thank, thank you. you. So thank you all for sharing a sample of some of the activities that you're doing with social annotation in your classes. In the last 20 minutes, I'm going to invite folks to drop their questions in the Q&A. Uh, we've seen one come in, but we'll take some time for you to, to maybe think about your other questions. And uh, as you do that, I'm just going to ask a quick question because some of the panelists alluded to this um, while they were sharing examples of their activities. And so my, that question is, what has student reception been to using social annotation in the classroom? Um, Joshua and Julia, I know you alluded to that while you were speaking before, so I'm going to invite either of you to start. I can go first. It's interesting because when um, when we were talking about these questions where I was, um, you know, it was my perception of how it was being received. And so from the outside looking in, I work in the Teaching and Learning Center and I'm supporting faculty who are um, running the pilot. Um, and so the instructor was telling me that you know, increased number of students were coming to office hours and really engaging in content, creating community. And I was like, wow, it's amazing. But I did um, want to kind of walk the talk. And so I did have the, we did share out a formative feedback form um, and really uh, directly ask, how is this supporting your learning uh, in particular hypothesis, but also the other components of the course. And as I did mention, this is replacing the final exam. And you know, a final exam is usually three hours and this is running through the course. So we are finding, and I, I think this is a good word of caution that it, it, the workload is a little bit higher and the students are noticing it. And so when they have five courses and there's this kind of ongoing, so while I think it's actually quite excellent for the learning and the people who are engaging are loving it, um, it is a little bit more work, both um, from the aspect of um, the student perspective, but also maybe a little bit on the grading perspective. So we're doing two annotations per week over 10 modules, which is probably I think maybe too much. So um, that I, I wanted to share that in full disclosure. I did really ask about it. Um, so, but many students are saying, I never expected this to be my favorite class. I'm loving it. Um, but I think there's a variety of reasons for that. And it probably always has to go back to the human aspect that the instructor is fantastic. The TAs are amazing and they're really being available and supporting the students through the process. So the tool is one component of it being an amazing course, but the workload is, is high. <laughs> And Julia, do you mean workload is high for the students, for the instructor, for both? For both, for both. Yeah, I think we might need to adjust, actually. We probably should scale it back, but we have to have a little team conversation about that. Yeah. 
Thank you. No, I appreciate hearing both the successes, but also some of the challenges and maybe things that you would do differently in the future. That's great. Thank you, Joshua. Yeah, so the the use of the uh, social annotation tool is very fluid uh, in the class and how I'm using it because really the concepts that we talk about each week are built on um, every single week and it's greater connections that are made. So um, <clears throat> part of the reason why I wanted to try it was when you're talking about professional standards and codes of conduct and ethics, um, particularly in you know the justice related fields, they're quite dense. Um, and then when you look at the job requirements in terms of specific uh, descriptors and expectations, they're also very detailed, um, making it challenging for individuals to, you know, dig in and draw those connections. And I've, I've heard that numerous times in the past when I've taught this course. And when we, we have them fill out, um, you know, learning contracts that look at, you know, you know, what is your goal? What are your strategies? How do you uh, need to meet those goals? And how are you going to prove that you've accomplished those goals as part of their um, placements and as part of their career prep course? Students often struggled with making those connections. So this gives us the ability to actually pull up job descriptions, to actually dig into those core ethical practices and principles and highlight some of the phrases that they need to be aware of and understand so that when they can go back and, and discuss with supervisors or discuss with, you know, potential employers, their knowledge and understanding and what they've done as an individual. Uh, it's really helpful. Um, as I said, you know, last week we went through some job descriptions that if you've ever looked at a job description to work for the government, you know that it's, you know, a three, four, five page document just to figure out how to apply to the job and what the skills are that are required of the job. And then you sit and you're given a maximum of three pages to, to present everything that you have as an individual um, that makes you stand out from the other 2,500 applicants that are trying to put in for this particular job. So the students have been really receptive in terms of being able to look clearly at what are those keywords, what are those key phrases, and then draw those connections so that when they're filling out those documents, what are my goals? What do I want to work on? And how do I demonstrate that I've worked on those? Um, it's, it's been a lot more um, positive than in years past uh, because it's a tool that is helping to actually identify and pull them out and bring those things to life uh, for the students within the classrooms. Um, it's, it's a bit of a challenge in so much that we're not physically in a classroom right now. Um, and I can't sit and go through things with them in the class as we would in a class. Um, but this is a great tool to be able to break up those three, four, five page job descriptions and actually dissect it in a way that the students can relate to and understand. And uh, it's been a lot more uh, positive outcomes in terms of the connections of what the expectations are and for the class but also what the expectations would be when they're going into the field they're a lot more forthcoming with examples of well when i worked i experienced this does that relate to this term or their concept that they've talked about here in this job application 100 percent, it does and that's a perfect example that you could use when you walk into a job interview of tell me a time when um, so the students are becoming much more comfortable with what's expected of them in their placements and in, in the field itself. And they're able to articulate um, their unique experiences. So, Thank you, Joshua. Ian and Marie, or Marie, have you had similar experience? Um, have, have you noticed that your students have expressed similar things? I would say yes, that's that's a resounding. I'm finding my learners are really enjoying the opportunity to look at an array of information in a thoughtful and reflective manner, such an added value with the annotation capability. And we're really building that community of inquiry and the reaction has been, can I look at more stuff? And in fact, I'm posting more things that even aren't scheduled for us to be looking at because they're enjoying the review and they're adding links even in their comments when they're responding to things so they're taking it even further than what the parameters are that what we've discussed so i, I often approach these kinds of scenarios is none of us are, are as smart as all of us and when we look at it from that perspective everybody's bringing that unique insight into that particular topic whatever it may be 
And I'm really enjoying their reflective approach and sharing approach. And even the, the hand up that they're providing for people that maybe don't have certain context pieces that they're actually providing that context to actually enhance the learner for the learning for their peers. So that's been my experience in terms of the reception. Thank Go ahead, Ian. Yeah, I think I've had a, a, a pretty favorable response as well. And I think that started in day one where, um, you know, I really kind of proposed using social annotation as part of a partnership. Uh, part of it was, you know, um, recognizing that a lot of times, for example, if things are posted, they're not read in earnest. Um, so I, I changed some of the evaluation in my course uh, to ensure that um, learners were, were kind of um, acknowledged for the reading they were doing prior to coming into lab. They really like the immediacy. And by that, I mean, they can go on, the, the, the reading pain is there. They can see their colleagues kind of post. They can see me coming on and either responding to questions or, or asking questions of them or providing resources. And they're also providing resources to each other, which I think is great. Uh, the social annotation uh, bit I'm doing with the orthopedic assessment group is, is uh, again, very favorable. And I think what they like to see is, um, you know, when you take textbook learning, and you kind of uh, try to read that and then bring it into practice. They really appreciate the, the clinical experience I can kind of speak to. Um, and they really like uh, learning about kind of when I wasn't able to have favorable responses. So they, they, they enjoy kind of, um, you know, recognizing that there's, uh, um, you know, instances where being in the, the profession, there isn't an expectation you're always going to be right. And there, there's a learning process regardless. Um, I mentioned this idea of it being a partnership. So I, I kind of keep checking in with them as well in terms of what's working well and what's what's uh, potentially a, an issue. And, and we've been troubleshooting as we've gone along. Um, I mentioned at the beginning to to both cohorts that uh, it's, it's kind of a, a learning kind of thing for me as well. So uh, I'm gonna be checking in. If you have things that you, you, you think are important to kind of mention, please do so. And, and they've taken that, that spirit of kind of cooperation, which is, is great. I mean, who wouldn't want that in their classroom? Thanks, Ian. I think that's a really great segue into a question by Lisa Taylor that's in the Q&A. Um, so I'd encourage you to, to, con to look at the Q&A and read that question for yourself, but I'll highlight some of the main points in the question and then turn it over to Julia <laughs> to answer. Um, oh, Julia looked like she was raising her hand. We have observed social annotation being used in science courses like physics, where at times contributions often reflect that a student doesn't understand a core principle. This is different than topics where there is opinion and interpretation. So other students then feel pressure to correct the mistakes in an environment where they don't have relationships and find that they are spending a lot of time guiding their classmates instead of doing their own heavy work or the error stands and um, a whole thread may go down the wrong path. So what is your reaction to that? And, and how might you make better use of the tools in situations like that? Um, who would like to? address that question. I'm sorry, I meant I meant for my colleagues to answer that, but I wanted to apologize because I did. I, I'm like one of those kids who click on too many things and I, I answered the question too soon. So I would like that to get in the queue. Did anybody else? I think it's a really uh, important question to, to talk about. But um, Ian, maybe you because you were just sort of addressing it, I'll bounce it back to you. And sorry for my hand waving. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's a funny thing. Um, because um, a lot of times a student experience is one of absolutes. So when they do a reading, they expect what they see in the reading to be, you know, the, the truth. Um, the unfortunate reality with something like orthopedic assessment is there's an awful lot of gray. Um, so in many ways, at least from an applied science perspective, uh, the issue is, is kind of taking the, the readings as kind of a, a starting point and then having those discussions. In terms of hard sciences, uh, you know, if there's, um, um, something where there's more of a black and white issue. I, 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 yeah, I'm not really sure. I mean, is it something where um, perhaps there's an opportunity for some other activities to happen before the social annotation uh, where people are, as, as learners have that opportunity to kind of check their learning. So maybe like a, a pre quiz kind of thing or, or something like a low stakes kind of thing where people might not necessarily feel that pressure um, because we often forget there is that social element to learning and, and, uh, in, in some contexts, in some learning environments, there's a lot of pressure to compete as well. So um, I, I'm not quite sure of, of other kind of solutions. So I'm, I'm going to turn off my mic and see if anyone else has other thoughts. 
I can jump back in on that one um, because in the class that we're running, we do take care of these kind of black and white answers as part as part of the quiz, just to test understanding for the, you know, what are the main learning outcomes and just sort of if it is something that multiple choice can be auto graded, then that can be moved over to something else. Hypothesis, I find, is much better for these nuance types things that, are, you know, there is no actual correct answer. But I, I think it also speaks to the point that we brought right from the beginning about how this is visualizing understanding. So what, like, uh, right away, you're, be, you're able to understand, you're seeing that people completely misunderstand it. And would that have gone, been invisible before? Um, would that have just gone unchecked? And so that's a really interesting thing to emerge. It's a problem, but it, it's not a new problem. <laughs> it's a problem that, that would have existed anyway. Um, and it is a lot of responsibility to put onto the other students, but that's part of um, really this humanizing aspect of creating community. So um, Marie talked about the community of inquiry and how you can actually make sure that you have like a safe learning environment where you talk about ways of being and what is a respectful way to, to correct or, or guide and, and, and as opposed to it being like we're competing for a scholarship we're actually collaborating towards you know understanding and so it's a bit of a shift in thinking about the way that your learning is designed but it's it's a it's a much more um, collaborative and effective learning method but it's a great question and it's not like one that i could just be like do it like this and that's how it goes um, but those are some of the things is creating this, um, you know, community guidelines of how to interact with each other, make sure that the question is something that is can be expanded upon that doesn't really have a correct answer. And if it does, then it should then making people comfortable enough to be able to guide as opposed to uh, feeling insecure about it. Um, and, you know, we know that sorry, I'm going to keep going. We know that actually you learn more by teaching other people. So it a while it may not feel like for those other students that they're being held back because they're explaining it to somebody else. In fact, they're probably demonstrating their knowledge more than they ever would have and it's probably good for them. Okay, we'll stop there. Thank you. No, I think those were those were really important points made by both uh, Julia and Ian, especially that idea that we've kind of been talking about throughout of, vi of visualizing learning. Um, now, our the final question that I want to ask uh, and address quite quick address quickly in the last few minutes here similar but uh, similar and related is did you come across any unforeseen barriers or challenges to ensuring accessibility with social annotation tools and I'll maybe uh, turn it over to just one or two of you to speak on any challenges with accessibility or maybe a challenge more broadly I think the biggest challenge, and I guess this is bigger than than what referring to, I know the question was more focused on accessibility, but it, it was explaining the process, explaining the, the deeper expectations and the invitation to using this tool. I think the setup and setting the stage is so important in this context. And if you set the stage and have that opportunity to have that dialogue of, well, what about this? Well, what if somebody said, you know, that kind of um, minutia, shall we say, I, I think you can identify some of the challenges that maybe you as the faculty didn't initially think about because we get into this bubble where we see, okay, this makes sense to me. Does it make sense to anybody else? You know, we forget. So, so I think it's setting the stage is really important and, and that's kind of like a segue into what advice I would give somebody would be to, to really set the stage when you deploy something like this. Give it full consideration. Think about the needs of your student. Think about the concerns. Think about the questions they may have and try to get a little in front of those if you can. Thank you. I think one of the challenges, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ian. Uh, I think one of the challenges might be uh, you know, uh, a lot of times there's this, you know, you, you get excited as, as an educator and, and you want to kind of share and you want to kind of take things on and, and, uh, and, and really kind of bring them into the classroom. And I think one of the challenges sometimes is recognizing the scope of what you're bringing in. And um, I, I think, you know, a, a decent approach is to kind of, if you're interested in social annotation and you haven't used it, you know, start small. And I really love that. And I've started to incorporate that idea of annotating the syllabus uh, because, you know, I have been that person on day one that's kind of introduced it and, you know, that's, that's been kind of because it's required and, and it really is an opportunity for students to kind of explore and ask questions. And even if it's something as simple as that, I think that's, that's the, you know, a really good approach. The danger in doing too much is um, you get frustrated, students get frustrated and the real intent 
in terms of why you brought that out in the first place is lost. Yes, thank you, Ian. And I know from speaking to all of the panelists that that's sort of an idea that's replicated that's replicated across um, all of your experiences, which is to to start small and a really uh, great thing to keep in mind with sort of any using any educational technologies. I do want to point out um, that there is another great conversation that's happening in the Q and A with re with related to the differences between hypothesis and perusal. So we're we're out of time now, but I do encourage you to maybe go go read the comments. Uh, Julia and a colleague at eCampus Ontario, Lillian Hogendorn, have shared some really great insights and shared a link to a, an article about perusal written by the. University of Guelph Library that I encourage you all to read. Um, so as we conclude here, I just want to take the time to thank you all for your questions, for the discussion and sharing of resources that's happened in the chat, and to our panelists for sharing their experiences, their insights, um, and student feedback that they've received with social annotation. As we conclude, I do want to invite you all, um, maybe after this call, to visit an art a blog post that's written by Michelle Pekansky Brock. Um, her article is titled Rigor Through Empathy. And if you consult that document, you'll notice that um, our panelists have already started annotating the document with social annotation. And once you're here, so once you're here, here you'll be able to uh, create a hypothesis account if you haven't already by signing up or log in if you have already created it. And that will allow you to annotate, um, make your own annotations on the document or respond to some of the annotations that are already there. Um, and if you go so far as to actually download the hypothesis uh, ex Chrome extension to your browser, you'll be able to do the same for any reading on the web. So I encourage you to join in the fun and maybe get started with social annotation with this article. And as we, and as we wrap up, I want to point out that this is written by Mich Michelle Pekansky Brock, who is one of the fireside speakers who will be featured at our test conference in two weeks. Michelle, like our panelists today, highlights the importance of empathy and humanity in teaching, and the test conference will continue this conversation around these topics. So I hope that you will consider joining us at TESS. A link to register for TESS, along with this recording, will be shared uh, to you in a follow-up email in the next few days. So thank you, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, all. Bye-bye. Thank you.